The, if an adult is arrested, the public record law makes very clear that the initial face sheet and, I'm sorry, the, the face sheet and the initial narrative are public records and have to be provided. Um, there may be some information within those documents, social security numbers, uh, or other type of information that can be redacted according to some of these exceptions. Um, but you're starting at a basis that these are public records and you do have to be provided. Uh, you see down below we've cited a couple cases. Uh, one of them uh, was Snow versus the Department of Public Safety. Uh, this is a case that's actually important for two different points. Uh, one from a law, law enforcement perspective and one from a perspective of everybody. Uh, Mr. Snow was uh, requesting records concerning himself and requesting some sort of investigation records that had been undertaken with respect to Mr. Snow. It wasn't quite clear to us what type of investigation. Um, but there were investigatory records regarding Mr. Snow. He requested access to those records under the Access to Public Records Act. Um, whatever type of investigation that was going on did not culminate in an arrest. Um, we determined that there was a presumption in that type of situation where the arrest um, had not, where the situation had not culminated in an arrest, that there was a presumption that disclosing those records related to a specific person uh, would be a unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. Uh, there were a couple reasons for that. Um, one of them obviously relates to the fact that the records were identifiable to an individual employee, and it was a very similar case for the Rhode Island Supreme Court, Robinson versus Malinoff. Um, but the other was that the legislature specifically uh, indicated the threshold that the initial arrest of, of, uh, of, adult, uh, of adult persons is uh, public record. So to the extent that that threshold has not been met, um, there's an indication by the legislature that that's where the threshold should be. Uh, the other point that was important um, for not just law enforcement, for everybody, is that Mr. Snow was requesting records concerning himself. And I, I've seen that in many other situations where somebody will ask under the Access to Public Records Act for records that pertain to themselves. Under the Access to Public Records Act, the person making the request has no more of a right to the records than anybody else. Um, so, again, as Laura mentioned, it doesn't mean that exempt records can't be provided. Uh, but under the Access to Public Records Act, everybody is treated the same, no matter who they are, or no matter what the request is, or what they're going to end up using those records for. Exemption K on page 10. Exemption preliminary drafts, notes, impressions, memoranda, working papers, work products. However, documents submitted in a public meeting shall be deemed public. What you should note about this is that clause that makes those documents public only applies to the records that are specifically listed above it. We've actually been getting a lot of calls about this recently, so although the case I'm going to discuss occurred in 2004, I thought it was um, apropos because it's a pretty good example of how this exemption works. The complainant had requested this, uh, the contract of the former superintendent former superintendent had gone on a radio show and had discussed the contract. The public body had denied the records under A1, which is one of the exceptions Mike just talked about in great detail, because they said it was identifiable to an individual. They actually had provided parts of the document which were those categories that are specifically public even though they're identifiable. But the complainant still thought that it should be public under Exemption K. In finding that the school department had properly denied this document, we held that the contract was not a preliminary draft, note, impression, memorandum, working paper, or work product, and therefore that exemption didn't apply. And even if that contract had fit into one of those documents, because it was identifiable to an employee, it was in fact exempt under A1, and that K would not have taken precedence over A1 because this contract was identifiable to this individual. Exemption M exempts correspondence over to elected officials with or relating to those they represent and correspondence over to elected officials and their official capacity. And Exemption P exempts all investigatory records of public bodies pertaining to possible violations of statutes, rules, or regulation other than records of final action taken. This is similar to the law enforcement exception that Mike talked about earlier, except it obviously does not relate to law enforcement. Um, a good example of this would be, I believe, for the Department of Health, they do things like they go and investigate restaurants to see their cleanliness or whatever, and then um, 
all the other documents that went into this would not be public except for the record of final action taken where you could see the result of what happened of this inspection. Exemption S is one of the more important ones. It's a catch-all exemption, but what it does is it exempts all records, reports, opinions, information, and statements required to be kept confidential by federal law, regulation, state law, or rule of court. Um, these include things like health insurance records, Drivers Privacy Protection Act, criminal records of juveniles, and 911 takes. In fact, if you give a 911 take out, it is actually a crime. So this is sort of almost a third category of documents. We discussed that there are documents that are completely public, documents that are not public but a public body could choose to give out, and then this third category, which would be confidential documents that cannot be given out. We've talked about just a couple of the exceptions, but there are 25 exceptions, and the Supreme Court and the legislature have made clear that if a document falls within one of those 25 exceptions, it's exempt and there's no further inquiry. Again, as Laura mentioned, you know, except for the S exception that makes documents confidential, it doesn't block public bodies from providing access to exempt records. Uh, it just means that a public body does not have to. But assuming that one of these records does not fall within these 25 exceptions, it's presumed to be a public record, uh, then we get to the second question, which is the balancing test. Does the privacy interest in that document outweigh the public interest in disclosure? Uh, the public interest that we're looking at is uh, what Laura had talked about before with the purpose and what the United States Supreme Court had talked about, the focus being on how does that information shed light on how the government operates. That's really the focus of the public interest. Um, so that's just a 50-50 balancing test. If, if the privacy interest outweighs the public interest, it's exempt. If the public interest outweighs the privacy interest, it's a public record. And one of the best cases on this point, I'm aware of two months and many years ago by Judge Silverstein, um, and, and this case, which I think maybe came into the Rhode Island Supreme Court, was in 2007 by Judge, now uh, Rhode Island Supreme Court Justice Medeglia. Uh, there was a request made by the Fisheries Commercial uh, Alliance uh, for uh, information that was on an application for, um, for commercial fishermen to DEM. And DEM provided a lot of the information. They provided the name of the people um, who, uh, who had been requested, they provided some of the address information, the, the resident, not the, uh, not the home address, but the town that they resided in, and maybe even the zip code. Uh, but they refused to provide, and they said with the exempt, uh, the home addresses of all licensed commercial fishermen. Judge Gregory went through the 25 exceptions, determined that there was no exception for home addresses, uh, then he got to the balancing test. And he said that there was, he weighed the privacy interest versus the, the public interest. The privacy interest being in the person's home address. Um, that person, he kind of analogized it to the castle doctrine uh, for the lawyers out there, um, saying that this is where somebody's, somebody lives, it's their home residence. Uh, there was a significant privacy interest in that, he determined. Uh, he cited some United States Supreme Court cases on this, uh, versus the public interest. And when he looked at the public interest, he talked about what we just talked about here today. How does that information, how is disclosing these home addresses uh, shed light on the operation of government? And he basically acknowledged that you know, to the people receiving this, this information, it may be helpful. They were looking to communicate with other people uh, of their trade, it may be helpful in a mailing list case, um, but does the information shed light on how the government is going to operate? And he determined that it didn't. Uh, so in this case, uh, he determined that the home addresses uh, were exempt from public disclosure. Uh, as I said, that may be heading upstairs to the Supreme Court, so we'll see how, how uh, four of the five justices there uh, will want that if that doesn't even happen. Having said that, we're going to, uh, to jump right into the Open Meeting Act, and uh, let me start with that. Uh, actually, before I jump right into the Open Meetings Act, I wanted to touch on um, an issue that comes up a lot in our office. We get a lot of calls from people who think that the Open Meetings Act covers everything that happens, both inside and outside of the meeting. But the truth is that it really is limited to Open Meetings Act. And some of these perceived violations we get calls on that we, like I said, it's not following the Open Meetings Act, are Robert's Rules of Orders, violations of the public body's own rules, the town charter, or if a member of the public body discloses what happens during the executive session. Um, as we begin our journey into the Open Meetings Act, it's very helpful to hear the purpose which you see in front of you which says that it is essential that public business be performed in an open and public manner and that citizens be advised of and aware of the performance of public officials and the deliberations and decisions that go into the making of public policy. 
what I want you to take away from this slide 